Welcome back to the second part of our first QA Forum of 2022. I'm Dr. Michael Novick, the Director of Education and Associate Director of Quality Assurance for VRAD. In this segment, we'll be talking about a variety of cases we came across during our routine QA reviews. Here's our accreditation statement and the learning objectives for this segment. Our first patient is a 20-year-old woman with chronic pain. Let's begin by scrolling through the sagittal images from an MRI of an ankle. This is a fluid-sensitive sequence. You can see the ankle joint effusion. Here are the corresponding images from the non-fat saturated T1 weighted sequence. Remember, these are good images for fractures and for the T1 hypointensity that is characteristic of acute osteomyelitis. And for kicks, here is the coronal fluid sensitive sequence. Remember to pause the video if there is a particular image you want to scrutinize. Finally, let's scroll through the fluid sensitive axial images. This is a single image from the axial fluid sensitive sequence, which demonstrates patchy periarticular bone marrow edema. as well as irregular narrowing and subtle sclerosis of the middle subtalar joint. I think it's a little more conspicuous on this sagittal non-fat saturated T1 weighted image. So this is a case of tarsal coalition, which I think is not foremost in most of our minds when we're reviewing cases like this, but can be a cause of chronic pain. So let's talk a little bit about tarsal coalition. It's actually not abnormal fusion of two bones in the midfoot or a hind foot, but rather failure of normal segmentation. It's most commonly seen in adolescent males, and while it's frequently asymptomatic, as we've seen, it can also be a source of chronic pain. It's bilateral in approximately 50% of cases. There are three main subtypes, osseous, cartilaginous, and fibrous, and frankly, if you're not an MSK radiologist, I don't think you need to go into depth about these things. If you're so inclined, MRI is the modality of choice for differentiating between the three. The most common types of tarsal coalition are calcaneonavicular coalition, which gives rise to the anteater sign on plain radiographs, the elongated anterior process of the calcaneus and talocalcaneal coalition, which gives rise to the C-sign and the classic talar beak on lateral radiographs. The C-sign results from bridging between the sustentaculum tali and the medial talar dome, and the talar beak arises due to altered biomechanics from the coalition. Calcaneocuboid, talonavicular, and cubonavicular coalitions are somewhat less common. Here are the articles I referenced for this case in the event that you'd like to bone up on tarsal coalition, so to speak. Our next patient is a 58-year-old woman with a painful lump. Let's begin by scrolling through these axial fluid sensitive images. I'll direct your attention to the dorsum of the wrist. It's not a subtle finding. These are the coronal fluid sensitive images from the same patient. Once again, feel free to pause the video if you want to scrutinize a particular area. And finally, the coronal non-fat suppressed T1 weighted images.
Let's review our findings first on this axial fluid sensitive image. We have a large amount of loculated fluid in the fourth extensor tendon compartment. This likely accounts for the patient's palpable abnormality. This patient has quite a bit of significant degenerative change, particularly at the base of the thumb. So who could blame you for missing this incidental finding? We call this failed segmentation because this is a congenital anomaly. The bones are not in fact fused, they just failed to separate. So this is a case of lunotriquetral carpal coalition, the most common kind of carpal coalition. And if you don't deploy your search pattern once you've made the main finding, you might miss this. Let's talk briefly about carpal coalition. It's an abnormal congenital union of two or more bones in the wrist. It can occur between any two bones. But the two most frequent subtypes are lunotriquetral and capitohamate. As is the case with tarsal coalition, there are three types, osseous, cartilaginous, and fibrous, and MRI is going to be your modality of choice for differentiating between the three. This is a nice article I'd recommend reviewing. In this case, it was an incidental finding, but frequently tarsal and carpal coalitions can cause chronic pain. Our third patient is a 48-year-old woman with necrotizing fasciitis. Let's start by scrolling through the axial images from this contrast-enhanced CT scan of the lower extremity. There are some fairly conspicuous findings here, but remember this is the QA forum for a reason. Here are the same images with the bone windows on. These are thin cuts, so it takes a bit of time to get through them all. Let's review the findings. There is loculated air and fluid dissecting through the deep intramuscular fat planes. Quite a bit of soft tissue gas in keeping with the history of necrotizing fasciitis. But you would really have to be dedicated to your search pattern not to miss the intraosseous gas in the fifth phalanges. So this is another case of emphysematous osteomyelitis. We've seen them in the forum before. And CT scan is your modality of choice for these. It is very difficult to pick up, but if you see lots of soft tissue gas, scrutinize those bones really carefully. This is an old but still relevant reference article if you're looking for some light reading. Next up is an 89-year-old man with generalized weakness for two days. These are the axial images from a non-contrast CT scan of the head. 
these sagittal images from the same patient. Always remember to request the coronal and sagittal reformatted images if you don't have them. There is important pathology that can easily be missed on the axial images. On that note, here is a single slice from the sagittal series. Note the tip of the odontoid process projecting into the foramen magnum. Resulting in mass effect on the upper cervical cord. So this is a case of basilar impression. I'm sure we've all missed this on head CTs, especially if we don't have the reformatted images. It's not something we typically look for, but it should be included in your search pattern. There are some measurements you can deploy here, but I would take them all with a grain of salt. There's a lot of disagreement about whether or not these are accurate or useful. McRae's line, for example, measures a line along the undersurface of the foramen magnum. If the tip of the odontoid process projects above this line, that's diagnostic of basilar invagination or basilar impression. You have Chamberlain's line, above which the tip of the odontoid process should not project by more than three millimeters. And finally, McGregor's line above which the tip of the odontoid process should not project by more than five millimeters. So you can see this is all a little bit subjective. I would use your judgment and most importantly look for mass effect and narrowing of the foramen magnum. A few brief words about basilar invagination. Typically when we use the term invagination we're talking about someone with a congenital superior displacement of the dens and normal underlying bone whereas impression refers to an acquired condition with underlying osteomalacia. I find the mnemonic PF Roach useful, Paget's disease, fibrous dysplasia, rheumatoid arthritis, osteogenesis imperfecta, achondroplasia, Chiari malformations, and hyperparathyroidism when we're talking about acquired cases of basilar impression. When it comes to surgical management, we have another classification system we use, group 1 versus group 2 patients. Group 1 patients do not have underlying Chiari malformations, whereas group 2 patients do. And that's useful because brainstem compression generally results from reduced posterior fossa volume in group 2, whereas in group 1, it's generally due to the upward displacement of the dens. Here's a couple of reference articles for you, and remember to take this all with a grain of salt. I think the most important thing to look for is the mass effect on the brainstem and the upper cervical spinal cord. Our last patient for this session is a 46-year-old woman with intermittent epigastric pain. These are axial images from a contrast-enhanced CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. The sagittal images here from the same patient. I wanted to show this case because I think a lot of us omit the mesenteric vasculature from our search patterns, particularly if there's nothing directing us there from the clinical history. In this case, the celiac axis is abnormal. It's enlarged with very subtle associated intraluminal hypoattenuation. 
and there's mild perivascular haziness. This is going to be a differential diagnosis. I'll usually say the findings are concerning for nonspecific vasculitis, but I'll also recommend a follow-up CTA to rule out dissection or even potentially partial thrombosis. So that's it for this segment. Thanks for joining me. I hope you found it informative, and I will see you next time.